Okay. We ready? Yes, we are live. You can go ahead. Okay. Hi. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to EPC's event on uh, COVID, the impact of COVID, of COVID-19 on cancer care across Europe. Um, I'm very happy to welcome a, a broad range of speakers this morning for our event. Uh, a couple of people may have been held up in internet traffic, but we're hoping that they will be able to join us very, very soon. On the panel today, we have Johan de Munter, the president of the on Oncology Nursing Society, representing the largest and the most trusted segment, arguably, of the oncology health workforce. Um, and he will be followed by Greg Freiberg um, from Amgen, who are the kind sponsors of the event today. And as and when the others arrive, I will introduce them as well. Um, but first of all, I would like to hand over to Johan de Munter to give us his perspectives on how the current pandemic um, has affected cancer care in Belgium and our oncology nursing. Okay. Thank you very much, Emma, for this nice introduction. I will first share my slides. Um, so I, hopefully you can see my slides now. Uh, so thank you, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to talk about the healthcare professional's perspective on the treatment delays and lessons learned from the pandemic as the pandemic is still going on and accelerating again, uh, also here in Belgium, unfortunately. Uh, so thank you for the European Policy Centre for the invitation. So my name is indeed Johan de Munter. I am EON's president and I'm also working as a cancer nurse manager in the University Hospital in Ghent in Belgium. First of all, I have nothing to disclose. And to start, I want to tell you something about the current role of cancer nurses across Europe. And it's clear that the roles and responsibilities of cancer nurses has been transformed over the past century uh, tremendously uh, from cancer nurses providing bedside care with a few technology advances to advanced experts in cancer nursing and leaders responsible for everything in the cancer pathway from screening, as you see in the circle that was lately uh, uh, published in the Lancet Oncology, uh, from screening to survivorship, cancer nursing have a tremendous uh, task for the care and the outcome of cancer patients uh, uh, in treatment. But also in end-of-life care, they have a tremendous task. But also, if we relate it to this other uh, task to a pandemic, uh, if we see what the role of cancer nurses can be, is also they have very strong cancer nurses in infection control, because the prevention of infection is an important outcome uh, to measure in patients with cancer because of infectious complications, and all because they are a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in, in cancer care. So nurses and cancer nurses play a vital role in the prevention of infection in patients with cancer through nursing practice, research, and patient education. And we see like uh, that the use of evidence-based interventions to inform, assess, prevent, and assist in the management of emergencies caused by cancer therapies, and particularly in neutropenia, neutropenic sepsis, and septic shock, makes that cancer nurses are really experts also in prevention control. And this is very becoming very handy also in this pandemic if you want to uh, try to get safety for all uh, people, also for our cancer patients in treatment, but also patients coming to treatment or in survivorship. And what are cancer nursing particularly doing is like they're also analyzing the infection data, the treating and protecting patients for infections risks, not only patients that are the, uh, the source of the infection, but also pre uh, preventing and protecting patients and putting measures to protect patients with, uh, that has no immunity, protect them from uh, infectious diseases, for example, like COVID-19 at this moment. We also uh, do, uh, we protect them, we do research, and most of them, the cancer nurses, are involved or strongly involved in uh, making of these guidelines and, for example, uh, care pathways to prevent patients from an infection. And of course, we have a tremendous role in inform and educating patients and healthcare professionals. And this is a very important issue if you think about what's the role of cancer nursing if it's come to infection control. But unfortunately, we see now in, in everything what's happened in pandemic that nurses are mostly not around the table if it comes to making decisions or to making like policies if it comes, for example, in this pandemic. So this is something that we saw then in cancer nursing is that like in the second wave, uh, we saw that like, for example, uh, we, we see that like, where are these patients coming in now? Because there was 
like a drop down in the uptake of patients that had cancer. If you see the numbers in previous years, we were a little bit worried. And as millions of Europeans, Europeans come to terms with an unplanned for reality of this foreign pandemic, we saw, for example, that uh, there was a message to take patients at home and to stay home. And this also increased something like that patients with signs or like uh, signs and symptoms that could be cancer related. They also stayed home and didn't take up for this, uh, for example, to go to the healthcare provider, uh, to the, for example, the GP, and they didn't have any uh, investigations. So there was a, a lack of diagnosis and a delayed diagnosis in cancer care, as we see it now. But also that it could be like, for example, this is because of a lot of hospitals also across Europe faced with challenges with, for example, also uh, staffing shortages, providing enough personal uh, protectment, but also couldn't take the uptake, for example, to doing screening and diagnosis because of the massive uptake of patients with COVID-19 infection. And this is why Senate, uh, the European Oncology Nursing sent out this message, uh, in, it was during the second wave, that we make that message clear that people, if you have like any symptoms or you're worried about symptoms, that it was a very important, of course, for COVID reasons to don't take any risks, but also for the other reasons for the uptake, it would be very important that you go to a GP or to a healthcare professional team to see if there were any symptoms that it could be investigated properly and getting access to, for example, screening, but also to diagnosis and get a proper diagnosis to start treatment because every delay is a delay that we don't want to have in cancer care. So what it uh, created COVID-19 then for cancer care in general? I think the challenges in cancer care are already there. There is an increasing demand of care. And this is, first of all, also by cancer. If you see the rising numbers of cancer, that was why the European Beating Cancer Plan was instead to conquer and to uh, to tackle these numbers, but also there is an increasing demand of care by COVID-19. And this is something, as we see now, there is, all uh, there is a clear role for cancer nurses there also. And uh, it's clear that, of course, that the role of cancer nurses will continue to evolve. And by this uh, increasing demand of care, there was also a, the need of an extraction of healthcare professionals from several uh, units to, for example, now to intensive care and to emergency department to tackle the income patients of COVID-19. And also there was an extraction of cancer nurses from their ward to these departments that affected to, for example, cancer care and the outcome for cancer treatments. We saw that also there was a product and equipment shortages in, a, in, a, in the wards across Europe. If we see like the uptake from protective materials, we saw there was a, a, a not enough, there was a shortage, but also we need this in daily care for cancer patients. For example, if you think about hematology wards where they have stem cell transplantations with patients where the, uh, you need also this protective equipment. And we saw there was a shortage and it was also challenging uh, to work with this if, during COVID. Now it's already better, but we tackled this problem. I see in some countries it's still a problem to get the products, to get the treatments, but also the equipment that is necessary to protect our healthcare workforce. We see there as a change in care environment, how COVID-19 changed overnight everything, how we did it in the hospital. So there was like so there was no experience with a real pandemic before in Europe, I think. And we hadn't, we couldn't fall back on routines uh, that we used in the past. So we need to change the care environment, but also the uptake, for example, we transform from a, a manually life to life person, patient, uh, and healthcare providing workplace to, for example, the e health workplace, but was also increasing tremendously, a change to telemedicine, but this was also a learning process for the healthcare professionals. And also what we see it also like economical impact that it had because also the budget for, for example, for ICT in the hospital raised tremendously. We saw there's also a disruption in cancer care systems. Uh, as we saw, there was an, uh, a delay, for example, in diagnoses, uh, screening programs went down, uh, but also, for example, in the units where healthcare professionals were tra transformed, uh, trans transferred to, for example, uh, to COVID uh, units and cohort units to help other professionals to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we also see, there was an increased need of psychosocial care. 
uh, in cancer, tremendously also in cancer care, but I think with all patients in a hospital, because of, for example, visiting was cancelled by their families, the support of their family and their carers was cancelled. There was even, it was difficult to get in contact. So there was a tremendous uptake from healthcare professionals to increase the psychosocial care for patients. And it was not always easy, as we have also a shortage of healthcare professionals caring for patients with cancer. So it was not always easy to provide the necessary psychosocial care in this uh, time of a pandemic. So I think it's very important uh, how we can tackle this is about the care principle that we use, of course, in EONS also. And communication efforts should be conducted in order to adequately inform European citizens to immediately visit their healthcare team in case of suspected cancer symptoms and not stay home until post-pandemic times. And this is a really important message we have to bring. And I think also nurses in general and cancer nurses have a tremendous uptick and expertise in providing an uptick and increasing the health literacy with patients and inform patients or inform citizens to take these uh, preventive actions. It's also important, I think, that we advocating for maintaining screening, diagnostic treatment and follow-up surgeries as advised by cancer care professionals to minimize the time to diagnosis and treatment and getting and uptake the patient's outcome in a positive way. But also there is a need of more resources to conduct nursing research on the impact of the pandemic and uh, on the cancer nursing workforce as on cancer nursing patients' treatments and quality uh, of life outcomes in the future. And then also in education stays key and strengthen education across Europe by implementing the cancer nursing education framework, I will come back to that in the, EU, in the EU member states to increase movability across Europe when crises occur like this COVID-19 pandemic. And that is what we see that in some countries where the shortage is tremendously, at this moment, it was very uh, difficult, for example, to move cancer nurses across Europe because also the, how they educate cancer nurses is not the same and the qualifications are not there to practice in another country, for example, across Europe. But also, there are some challenges in cancer nursing, and it, uh, there is already a general nursing shortage, that is for sure, uh, and it's important we're going to tackle this. There are also recruitment barriers for people, uh, because people uh, are a little bit afraid, for example, the complexity uh, to work in cancer care, and uh, for course, of the hazardous work environments, uh, this is scaring some people to come into uh, nursing, and especially in cancer nursing. There's also occupational uh, safety issues that we talk about, uh, like, for example, to protect our healthcare workforce. Uh, there is a difficult cancer nursing mobility, and this is what I explained before, because of educational, the, how we, uh, cancer nurses are educated. Uh, that is something we can't move around uh, Europe, and that is something we have to build in the future to tackle this also, that we increase the movability so we can support each other across Europe. But also there is an increased risk of burnout and dropout. This is already introduced by the, by the shortages and strengthened now with the COVID-19 pandemic. We see there is a high physical and psychological stress among the healthcare professionals and also especially in cancer nursing and in nursing generally. And at least there is also a lack of nursing recognition. And this is something that was already done and the European Oncology Nursing did the recamp uh, project, and we saw that there are massive differences about recognition across Europe. And this is something we should tackle in the future to also tackle the other problems and the challenges in cancer nursing. And this is what I talked about: is the education of cancer nursing. And Eons has a tremendous expertise and a long-lasting um, yeah, advocacy for taking up this cancer nursing educational framework. And this framework will conduct and give the European member states the opportunity to develop in the same way cancer nurses so we can increase this movability across Europe and especially in pandemic times when we can use each other's expertise and we can use uh, each other's strengths to tackle this pandemic across Europe. Another ch uh, changing healthcare environment is the uptake of like the digital world and this is also something very challenging and uh, we saw a lot of countries and we saw a lot across Europe that was like an overnight change to going to these e-health platforms for the using of the telemedicines. 
And for example, art piece consultations for many have gone online in order to protect immunosuppressed patients in cancer care from this infection environment. And of course, telemedicine and e-health tools could provide hospitals safely to continue some patient consultations and follow up. But we have to think the role in means of communication cannot replace all face-to-face -face consultations. Uh, for example, where critical observations and psychosocial support need to be provided for patients. So it's a, it's a new way of thinking and to incorporate this e-health and telemedicine uh, ways how to do it. Also, it increased uh, ICT budget in the hospital. And we need to think how we can incorporate this in a safe way in the future in our care pathways for cancer and how we can use it, for example, to tackle uh, pandemics like the COVID-19 pandemic. So what do we really need then for the future to do this as I also and to tackle maybe hopefully not the future pandemics, but hopefully coming out first of all out of the pandemic COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's important that in Europe across Europe, we start strengthening the education and training and use the educational framework to provide everybody in the same way, for example, in cancer nursing. So we increase this movability across Europe so we can strengthen each other and support each other across Europe. We need to put some efforts in research and development, uh, research in how cancer nursing can also increase uh, and uptake uh, this crisis, but also in patients, how they tackle this uh, COVID-19 crisis and what were the outcomes and how it affects cancer care and how we can tackle this and develop then tools for the future so we are prepared if this something is occurring again. It's also important to take up the leadership and the recognition. So uh, cancer nurses are massive leaders and they have like, great management skills in providing in times when, for example, infection and prevention come massively important. And then there is also the care coordination across Europe. I think it's, it's important that we uh, create this care coordination across Europe to tackle COVID-19 pandemic and also think about how we tackle the e-care coordination because it's something we have to put effort in it and to learn to work with it in a safe way and that we reach the same good quality outcomes for our patients and not losing quality to stepping into the digital world. And of course, we need to listen to the voice of the patients, what happened with them, and take this up and take this in all our policy making, how to provide the best health care for them in the future and tackle the cancer burden in Europe, even by a COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to conclude as like the best way to tackle the COVID-19 in healthcare and for the safer, better workforce in Europe is to tackle it together. And I think like uh, we said in a lot of times, it's like, all healthcare professionals, we work together, so we need to train together and think together how we're going to tackle this. And again, I want to say it's important every effort that everybody making, but like, for example, these basic measures could help the healthcare professionals also protect in Europe so they can deliver the best care for cancer patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johan. That was particularly interesting. And I very much like your last point about the importance of the multidisciplinary team um, and how the different professions need to stick together to, to, to keep the process going. Um, and we have next uh, Professor Tit Albrecht, who is uh, working in the National Institute of Public Health in Slovenia in the cancer community. The National Institute of Public Health in Slovenia has been extremely important over the last decade or so leading the joint actions um, against cancer. So it is well placed to have a unique perspective on how COVID has affected cancer care across uh, the region. So very warm welcome to you, Tit, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Emma, for the kind words. I also remember our rather close collaboration at the beginning of the joint actions when you were also uh, representing the EON, uh, E. ONS uh, for a period of time. And uh, I think that many points that Johan raised about the role of the, of the oncology nurses, of course, apply in all situations. <laughs> the fact that uh, the pandemic put everyone under a lot of stress and um, um, made some of the managers uh, believe that everyone 
can be uh, moved around the system and while we still need uh, rather focused uh, focused professionals uh, i decided not to have slides not uh, the, the least because um, somehow sometimes we are saturated and this is by no means the uh, criticism of Johan's presentation. I think he he framed uh, the, the the problem and the issues around the, the pandemic in a broader context, which of course uh, is very helpful and gives me a lot of uh, room to, to elaborate. First of all, I would go back to when the epidemic started. And I, um, well, I think all of you will remember that prior to this uh, pandemic, um, all countries were somehow preparing for, uh, there was a, actually in all countries, there was a request by the WHO to have a document on uh, the so-called preparedness plan. In many countries, uh, the governments were rather critical about these plans because they, uh, I think there was a basic problem with them they assumed that the new pandemic would be very similar, just a bit bad, uh, worse, more, more unpleasant than the previous classical flu pandemics. So that it would spread in a similar way, that uh, the same interventions would work, that, that we would not have to really um, put our societies upside down, not to, not to mention healthcare. And I think this was one of the, decisive elements which at the beginning of the pandemic caused um, a lot of commotion and a lot of um, unpleasant situations for everyone. Uh, first of all, in healthcare, I would say, uh, we had a lot of um, unverified information because nobody had a clue, uh, to be honest, uh, at the beginning. Uh, the, the suggestions and recommendations were overflowing and even the general public was a bit confused. Why I'm mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because of course, this affected uh, the, the healthcare system in the sense that it, was, it became very defensive. Every contact was deemed dangerous and risky. And in many cases, it actually was as, as it proved to be. And many health professionals in several European countries, unfortunately, even those well off and those regions of those countries where you wouldn't expect that to happen, didn't have enough protective equipment. I will quote um, the German minister Jens Spahn, who in uh, the presidency conference of Slovenia in July uh, mentioned an interesting comparison and he uh, referred to the fact that Europe found itself in front of the lack of protective equipment because all the production was moved to China. And this is not to heat up any uh, uh, inappropriate um, arguments or stigmatizing a nation, it's just a fact. And he, he made a comparison that European industry would never be allowed to transfer strategic uh, production to China or to any other continent for that matter, uh, where we really think that it is very critical. But apparently um, face masks, uh, scaphanders, other protective equipment were good enough to be produced so far away that even the transport took a long time. Addressing cancer care in the pandemic. I think that uh, what we know at this moment, looking back, we see that cancer, similarly as it is a tradition in Europe that it is financially protected for the patient largely. I will not say that everyone in Europe has the same level of financial protection with respect to cancer care, but it's much better than in other continents. But on the other hand, we, we saw that this commitment took governments to protect cancer care in most instances from interventions that affected other specialties in, in other medical specialties. Uh, in my own country, oncology services were not touched. 
no personnel was moved, no services were cut, and no access was stopped. This is the bright side. <laughs> the downside is that the screening, because of unclear modes of uh, transmission, was largely stopped in the first wave. This had a negative impact, and this was not the case only in Slovenia, but in most countries, I think, uh, or at least reduced to a very uh, large degree. This, of course, can have very detrimental effects uh, on the entire population. And later, uh, we restarted uh, our screening program since May, immediately when the situation improved after the first wave, which in the end was not even that bad in Slovenia. So um, we got prepared for the, for the next months to come. So we finished the year 2020 with the same number and the same coverages as we had in 2019. So also the population had trust. And I think that this was one of the messages I heard from Johan's um, presentation. We have to maintain trust in the services and cancer care is even more important overall. I mean, not only screening, uh, uh, because people are more stressed out because of the diagnosis. The, uh, the disease is very complex and requires very complex and comprehensive treatments. What, did, what was affected was, of course, two other issues. Uh, one was the early detection and referrals. Early detection outside of screening programs, the one that is triggered by patients or sometimes also by the medical or other professionals, that of course did not work so well. Patients soon realized that healthcare was a partly dangerous to them because the, the possibility of getting infected in healthcare was not so low. And uh, we know that this was the fact because of the um, the, the volume of, of, of uh, patients arriving in the second and the third wave. And this was very difficult before the vaccine period, very difficult to address. And the, the health professionals themselves were struggling to keep that and to keep their ranks healthy. Uh, so this was an important deterrent. In Slovenia, we carried out, we carry out a two weekly survey, which addresses a lot of the aspects of how people perceive the, the pandemic, uh, pandemic fatigue, and also attitude to different issues related to health. I will not speak of other issues except for the one where there is a specific question on whether they uh, decided not to seek care for symptoms appearing in the last two weeks. This was a very simple and clear question. At the peak of the pandemic, this the percentage saying yes to this question was 45%, which means that half of the people who had symptoms did not want to go to seek medical nursing or other assistance in the system. Secondly, uh, this uh, percentage later declined uh, so that by the summer this year, it, uh, it reached only about 20%. But 20% at the population level is still a lot, given how important and how heavy a problem the, uh, the entire problem of cancer is. This means that if you have an incidence like Slovenia of 15,000 a year, uh, that might seem that 3,000 might not be uh, adequately uh, and soon enough uh, identified and diagnosed. Uh, so these aspects and this uh, this contributed to the fact that um, the the drop in the diagnosis, the first diagnosis of cancer, which depended of course on uh, partly on screening, but most importantly on early diagnosis and referral from general practitioners, dropped between ten and thirty percent in last year. What is even more um, damaging the whole thing uh, of, uh, of COVID caused at the current estimates by the estimations of our um, cancer registry that about 300 less cancer patients had, had died in 2020 because of course they died with COVID and they were then deemed to have died uh, with, uh, due to the infectious disease and not cancer. 
so the mortality will be seemingly lower, but of course that is not a uh, success of all of us, unfortunately, but just uh, uh, an interplay of different uh, events. What is now uh, preoccupying uh, is that the preventative activities overall, um, Johan already alluded to the, to the fact that the, the, there is a new heat up of the, of the pandemic. So preventative activities are affected in many countries uh, again. So uh, maybe not so much screening programs, but other types of prevention. In Slovenia, we have uh, uh, especially dedicated nurses in primary care who um, identify risk factors and work with the population uh, next to their uh, GPs. They invite them, they counsel them on lifestyle, but they also manage their chronic diseases. They help them to manage chronic diseases. And all these nurses are now working in uh, vaccination centers and on entry points where uh, PCR testing is being done because the volume has been significantly increased. Oncological care has currently, as of yet, not been affected, but we are on the margins. So uh, uh, due to the needs that uh, the, the pandemic has, uh, intensifying and enlarging the capacity of ICU beds means that there are not enough intensive medicine professionals. So those next to them who can help are those who work uh, as anesthetists and anesthetist nurses. These are now also being moved to, to um, uh, COVID ICUs. Um, and this will sooner or later affect the surgical program. As I mentioned at the moment, it doesn't look that bad yet, but uh, for us and for countries with a similarly high incidence rate, we are currently still running at an incidence rate, which is for most of you probably hard to imagine. It is around 2,000 per 100,000. Uh, so this is much, much higher than most of your countries have. Uh, especially not to mention the South European countries which were successful in vaccination. What would I say as the final message is as the, to carry on, um, not only for the immediate period, but more importantly for later on. Uh, there will be a hard period. I, I, I don't think it's pessimism. I don't think it's um, uh, now myself <laughs> sowing uh, a, a black picture or a dark picture of the future. The fact is that there will be delayed diagnosis. Uh, there will be two challenges in the healthcare system. There will be a high demand for more complex treatments, I'm afraid, because some of the patients will be diagnosed in later stages. This is one of the problems. A uh, second problem, which was already mentioned by Johan, is the, the, the problem of workforce. Workforce will not increase uh, in the management of NCDs, and no, nor will it in cancer, but it should. Uh, not only as a transient uh, requirement, uh, but also a long term, because uh, the, the tail of this impact is definitely there to, to be present with us for at least five to seven years, I would estimate. Given the dynamics of cancer, given the, its development uh, characteristics, this is almost inevitable. So this is not something that will be overcome like the waves in COVID in, in terms of months, uh, but it will, it will last definitely longer. Uh, the, the, the countries that will be under strain are those which have limited or insufficient diagnostic capacity, and especially those that have insufficient radiotherapy and uh, more advanced therapy capacity. I'm, I'm not speaking only of equipment, but also of staffing. Uh, another thing that we should all address, and uh, I'm glad about the, the set of speakers you, you uh, gathered today, uh, because of this uh, final problem I want to mention is that uh, healthcare has become a sort of a battlefield for many professionals and many unfortunately are leaving their profession even completely. Today I read, it's just an anecdote, but it tells a lot. 
Today, I read an anecdote that there is a digital health company, a startup that uh, put out a call for, for a doctor to, to work with them. And I'm sure that years ago, there wouldn't be such a turnout of candidates. But today I read that 12 specialists of different specialties applied for that one post, uh, which, where that they will completely leave their clinical environments. Among them, there are even a rheumatologist, a surgeon, and an anesthetist, which gives you a lot um, of information about how stressed they were in the last period. So protecting the health environments supporting the professionals, not only with salaries, uh, but also with psycho, uh, psychological support. Many were exposed to dying uh, every day. And I talked to some, and this cannot be overcome just by a uh, tap on the shoulder. And I think that for the future, um, the systems will have to provide this kind of support. And uh, nurses, um, I take advantage of saying that, uh, not only because you are here present, but also because they were the ones that carried out an, in, an enormous burden in this epidemic, in the entire system. And the stress in oncology was, there was another stress in oncology, protecting the patient even more than in other specialties. So because patients are so vulnerable immunologically, you have to be super safe. And uh, our Institute of Oncology also managed to protect them, themselves a lot. Any in, in uh, coming infection was very quickly uh, suppressed. So that was, that was a success that patients were actually not affected. The, this was my reflection for today. I hope it was not too long. Uh, I, I will be happy to, to continue the discussion and I will follow up, of course, with the, with the next discussions. Thank you very much, Emma, and all the, the panelists for, and participants for the invitation and for the uh, kind attention. Thank you very much, Tit. That was fascinating and, and very granular. Good to hear that uh, Slovenian experience. There are a couple of points especially about the, the tail end of impact that I'd like to pick up on um, in the discussion section. Um, and now I would like to turn to Antonella. Antonella is the Chief uh, Executive Officer of the European Cancer Patients Coalition who have showed incredible resilience throughout the pandemic, um, supporting the community of cancer patients across Europe. And I'm very looking forward to hearing from you, Antonella, about the disruptions in cancer care pathway uh, from your very specific and uh, important perspective. Uh, thank you. I, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you, uh, Emma and the uh, EPC for inviting me to present on uh, um, what uh, the impact uh, of COVID-19 has been on, uh, on cancer uh, and cancer patients uh, specifically. Uh, so as, uh, as you said, I am the director uh, of the European Cancer Patient Coalition. As this is a rather new um, audience, uh, I think uh, a, a few words of introduction to what uh, uh, ECPC, the European Cancer Patient Coalition is, uh, uh, it's uh, um, worth uh, uh, doing. So. Uh, we are the largest uh, cancer patient umbrella organization in uh, Europe. Uh, we were founded in uh, 2003, and uh, today we count on 470 members in 50 countries uh, globally. So we cover the whole of Europe, plus uh, we have at least uh, one member uh, per continent. Uh, and uh, uh, one of uh, our major uh, priorities uh, is to make sure that uh, um, uh, we overcome inequalities uh, across Europe and uh, within uh, member states. Uh, so we work uh, uh, towards uh, making sure that uh, all cancer patients have the same best uh, uh, treatment, uh, uh, no matter where they live or where they were born. Uh, what makes us uh, different? from uh, any other cancer patient organization in Europe is that uh, we cover all cancer types uh, from the uh, 
rarest uh, to the most common. Uh, and so uh, we uh, don't work on specific uh, cancers. So we tend to work uh, more broadly on uh, policy. Uh, and for instance, uh, to that extent, uh, we are currently managing uh, the secretariat of the first uh, parliamentary intergroup on cancer that's called uh, Challenge Cancer. We also work a lot on research and we are member of all the uh, largest uh, EU funded uh, uh, projects uh, on uh, oncology. And uh, we work a lot uh, on uh, uh, empowering uh, our members uh, as uh, uh, we believe uh, that uh, cancer patients are uh, the best uh, advocates uh, for themselves, uh, but in order to do so, they need uh, to be uh, empowered. Uh, and we work on a number of uh, raising awareness uh, campaigns uh, for cancer patients, uh, policymakers, uh, and uh, the wider audience. So uh, if we look at the time of the pandemic, uh, uh, we have heard uh, now uh, already from uh, both uh, Tate and John uh, that uh, the uh, pandemic has uh, been disruptive for the health system, but uh, most of all for uh, cancer care. Uh, and the pandemic has also revealed the weaknesses of, of all the health systems in Europe and, uh, and globally. Uh, one interesting point is that in 2020, 2.7 million people in the European Union were diagnosed with uh, cancer, uh, and another 1.3 million people uh, lost uh, their lives to it. And still, uh, when it comes uh, to the new diagnosis uh, of cancer, there was a 40% drop, drop uh, in, uh, in cancer diagnosis in 2020. And uh, uh, of course, uh, this means uh, uh, what has already been mentioned by Tit, uh, that uh, uh, as uh, uh, the diagnosis uh, decreased, uh, this means uh, that uh, we are expecting a spike in the uh, cancer diagnosis uh, in the uh, near future, uh, meaning that uh, more cancer patients will be diagnosed with cancer at a later stage. And uh, you know that uh, early diagnosis uh, uh, is crucial for cancer patients. If uh, not uh, to save their lives, which is uh, very often the case, uh, a later diagnosis of cancer means um, uh, more uh, uh, costs for the health system to cure the cancer and uh, uh, also a um, uh, a bad uh, quality, a worse quality of life for the cancer patients or the cancer survivors. Uh, so, uh, what was uh, the impact of the pandemic on uh, cancer patients? Uh, it has uh, been uh, heavily, uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, heavy uh, physical and emotional distress for cancer patients. Uh, ongoing uh, uh, treatments uh, were postponed, and then uh, there was a disruptive uh, cancer care. Uh, almost everywhere. We heard uh, that in Slovenia, this was not uh, the case, but in most of the countries uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, this was the case, and uh, uh, revealed the weaknesses of the uh, health uh, uh, systems. So what uh, are the uh, lessons uh, uh, learned uh, uh, that, and what we can improve? Uh, so, uh, definitely, uh, we have uh, already heard that uh, multidisciplinary care teams are needed. Uh, COVID has uh, shown more than uh, um, uh, anything before that uh, multidisciplinary care is fundamental. Uh, digital health uh, is uh, also uh, very uh, important and uh, uh, cannot uh, be uh, ignored the beneficial impact of digital health uh, during the, the pandemic. Although on digital health, uh, we also need to be uh, aware that digital health, uh, when not appropriately uh, implemented, can create uh, even more inequalities across Europe. I'm thinking uh, about uh, people living in uh, rural areas uh, with uh, uh, difficult access to Wi-Fi or uh, elderly people even having uh, some uh, issues uh, accessing uh, digital health uh, properly. 
uh, then uh, we uh, need to improve interconnected care pathways. Uh, this is fundamental to uh, reduce the costs and uh, improve the, the, the treatment. Uh, then electronic health records um, uh, must be improved across Europe, not only within the same country. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this is uh, during the pandemic, it has been shown that, that uh, uh, the, uh, the weakness of uh, electronic health records uh, across Europe. And uh, we also believe uh, that uh, person-centered uh, uh, health systems uh, should be implemented uh, more and more. Uh, so what uh, uh, have we been doing as a cancer patient uh, organization uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, in order to support uh, our members and uh, the, the cancer community at uh, large uh, during the pandemic? Um, uh, at the beginning, uh, we, uh, we realized uh, that uh, there was a lot of confusion uh, uh, and uh, people really didn't know what to do, uh, not even uh, cancer patients at any level. So uh, we uh, set up a web hub on our uh, uh, website. And uh, we, uh, at the time when, uh, uh, when really we didn't know what was, uh, nobody knew what was uh, really happening, we also recommended our members to stay at home. So we recommended at the beginning to cancer patients to stay at home as that was the least harm uh, in that period. Uh, and, um, and we also recommended them to uh, look at uh, the uh, what their mem their countries uh, their governments uh, their uh, uh, ministry of health was uh, recommending uh, to to them to do and then uh, we also started uh, looking at uh, the all the, the guidelines uh, that were coming out from scientific societies and uh, we summarized uh, these uh, guidelines uh, uh, for what was uh, re re relevant for cancer patients uh, and we worked uh, with uh, uh, about uh, 30 uh, healthcare providers uh, uh, across uh, uh, Europe and uh, so we developed uh, some specific uh, guidelines um, first, uh, on how to deal uh, with cancer through the pandemic, and then also towards uh, the end, uh, what uh, vaccination uh, meant for, uh, for cancer patients. And those guidelines have been translated in 23 languages, including uh, Chinese and Arabic, uh, as uh, we have uh, lots of um, uh, migrants uh, across Europe uh, uh, speaking these two languages and only these two languages. Uh, then we have also uh, implemented a survey uh, to identify the uh, gaps in uh, cancer care for, uh, for cancer patients. We developed a social media uh, campaign and um, uh, we now are uh, continuing to support and uh, monitor the situation to support our members and monitor the, the situation. Uh, we have uh, a, a published a series of uh, patient stories and uh, uh, we also uh, organize uh, a number of uh, webinars to, to keep uh, the, the cancer community informed on the situation. Uh, and uh, uh, so through the survey, we have mapped the, the, uh, how uh, cancer, uh, cancer patients uh, um, uh, were uh, treated and uh, how the situation was for them uh, across uh, uh, Europe. Um, and uh, we, um, with, the, with this, we wanted to, with this survey, we wanted to, to uh, confront the policymakers and call for quality and equal access to treatment for cancer patients. Uh, and we wanted uh, to uh, show um, how the uh, health systems uh, uh, were disrupted and uh, uh, the treatment outcomes were deteriorated uh, through the pandemic. And uh, uh, with the, uh, through the survey, we also wanted uh, to uh, predict and uh, identify new advocacy policy and uh, research topics. 
uh, we also uh, developed uh, a joint uh, letter on COVID-19 and cancer uh, campaign. Uh, and uh, this uh, campaign was uh, launched on uh, the um, uh, uh, World Health Day on the 7th of uh, uh, April, 2021. Uh, it was a global campaign. On this campaign, uh, we have uh, collected uh, 320 signatories uh, globally, uh, and um, uh, we have uh, shared uh, this uh, uh, joint uh, letter with uh, all uh, um, uh, health ministers in the member states, uh, with uh, several uh, global uh, organizations uh, such as uh, uh, WHO and uh, uh, with uh, um, all uh, the policymakers in Europe, uh, such as um, the European Commission, the European Parliament, uh, and the Council. So, um, uh, this uh, letter uh, includes uh, three uh, recomm main recommendations uh, one uh, to member states, uh, to uh, to governments uh, globally. So uh, the, the first recommendation is to ensure that patients can access uh, diagnosis and treatment uh, safely. So this is uh, uh, very important as uh, uh, one of the main reasons why cancer patients uh, did uh, uh, not uh, uh, follow up with their screenings or their treatment uh, during the pandemic was because uh, they feared uh, the pandemic uh, more than they feared uh, to, to, to get cancer. Uh, then the second uh, um, recommendation is about identifying the impact of the pandemic on cancer services and design services uh, to mitigate this. So in order to change and improve uh, any situation, it is important uh, for the, the, the governments uh, to understand what uh, the uh, the challenges were, uh, what uh, the, uh, the the problems were uh, with the services. So this is uh, for us uh, very important uh, that uh, um, uh, governments uh, identify uh, the disruption and the, what caused the disruption, so that they can uh, uh, design um, uh, and plan uh, uh, better uh, models. Uh, then uh, the, the third recommendation is uh, uh, on uh, resourcing cancer services properly and safely for the long term. Uh, as uh, Tit mentioned, uh, we are expecting now a, 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 an increase in the uh, uh, expenditures on, uh, on health in general, but specifically on, on cancer, as there will be a spike in the uh, cancer diagnosis. So it is important for governments to be prepared uh, to this uh, uh, increase in, uh, in cancer diagnosis and allocate the proper uh, resources for that. Uh, then uh, uh, it's uh, important, uh, we identified another uh, important uh, um, priority, and that is uh, the uh, value-based and people-centered health assistance. So we all uh, need to work together. We mentioned this, uh, that uh, multi-stakeholder care is uh, fundamental, but it is also uh, this multi-stakeholder care should be value-based and uh, people-centered. And uh, uh, as... Um, said before, we also need to develop more and more evidence in order to strategize for the long-term sustainability. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to the discussion now. Thank you very much, Antonella. The one word that's coming to mind as I've been listening to all of the presentations is how do we maintain the resilience of our healthcare systems? Um, with this, given this enormous impact that everybody has has suffered, and not only the systems but also the patients themselves. Um, so, with great pleasure, now I'd like to hand over to Greg, who has a unique uh, company perspective on on COVID, um, who is going to talk to us about um, also his perceptions on the the disruptions to the cancer treatment. Part. Uh, thanks, Emma, uh, and, and it's a pleasure to be part of this distinguished group. I think you actually have uh, a, a wonderful example of the different trusted 
parts of the healthcare se uh, sector that need to come together to solve some of these complex problems. And um, now I work for a biotechnology company called Amgen in research and development, uh, but I am a card carrying medical oncologist. I've cared for patients. And from that standpoint, um, let me be uh, the uh, not the first, but but hopefully uh, one of the many that thanks all the people on this call as well. And Tanella, the work that you do for patients is, uh, as a trusted voice is um, essential. Uh, Professor Albright, of course, uh, ne never in our lifetimes, I think, has the public health sector been seen as uh, you know in, in such an important light. And and you, the work you do, of course, carrying the torch is incredible. And, and of course, Johan, uh, the 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 nurses uh, that are at the front line of care have been incredible heroes in the last 18, 24 months for cancer patients. So thank you, and thanks to all your constituents. If if I reflect on uh, on COVID and how we think about how uh, the healthcare system you know needs to evolve moving forward, I I tend to bin my ideas in groups of three, and 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 what COVID has done is really not unearthed anything new, but it certainly has put a very bright light on healthcare challenges that, that society has faced for uh, many decades. First and foremost, of course, is costs. Um, we've talked about the cost of, of humans pain and suffering. We've talked about the cost of uh, e even just healthcare resources, moving them around. And of course, then there's the literal cost. The healthcare systems weren't prepared to absorb the dollars and, and euros and, and other, other needs uh, to, to handle this pandemic. And, uh, you know, sadly, probably a, a, a case where the system is built on, on a familiar pattern of, of uh, you know, panic and neglect rather than something a little bit more uh, forward looking. So, you know, crossing the, you know, crossing those bridges when we come to them. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. You know, the second, um, you know, big pillar, uh, of course, healthcare disparities. It's come up uh, here many places, but uh, this is not just uh, by country or ethnicity, but certainly even by access to care uh, and quality, um, whether it's with uh, with screening and preventative measures, or again treatment to, to more high tech and, and more costly uh, medicine for advanced disease, uh, you know disparities, of course, are looking us square in the face, and we need to address that. The third large pillar that I think of a, uh, is a theme that's been raised uh, here as well, which is just the increase in chronic diseases that we're seeing. Uh, the truth is that that population is aging. Uh, in many countries, we know that in chronic diseases, whether it's diabetes or heart failure, but certainly cancer, um, which I like to think of as chronic diseases, as patients are living longer and, and living better. Uh, cancer ha has, of course, um, you know, run into some unique challenges. We know that screening for breast cancer, screening for colorectal cancer, one study out of in from the United States for the National Cancer Institute um, uh, quoted uh, that, you know, because of lost screening opportunities in in 2020 alone, we're going to see 10,000 excess deaths over the course of the next 10 years. Sadly, as as Professor Albrecht uh, nicely pointed out, this will be the gift that keeps on giving in a bad way, and the healthcare system is going to have to absorb that. Um, you know, I, I think we've also seen some nice um, uh, you know studies and statistics. Uh, cancer patients are being uh, diagnosed even with lung cancer. You know, the fact that they're I think in Spain, uh, one study said 38% less uh, diagnosis. Uh, in the last year, uh, it ranges between 25 and 50% across European countries. Those cancers, sadly, for the most part, are still there. They're just going to show their, uh, you know, they're going to pop their heads up at, in later stages, be more costly and more challenging. So, you know, staring at this, these problems are, are complex. They're deep rooted. Um, they didn't start with COVID, but, but of course, COVID does present an opportunity. And I think we have some wins that we can point to in the course of the past uh, year and a half, two years of, of how a future um, might unfold. And, and you know, this, this combination of, of words, Emma, you, you pointed out resilient, a resilient healthcare system, you know, multidisciplinary teams, many different stakeholders coming to the table. That's how we're going to have to, uh, you know, move forward. And, and just from a very, uh, you know, high level point of view, I think there's probably at least two um, themes that I would see would would be our solutions out of uh, some of these dilemmas. One would be, again, moving from a healthcare system that is, you know, focused on, you know, 
uh, finding things that are broken and fixing them. Yeah, and really thinking about more of the predict and the prevent approach. And you know, many people have been um, preaching these ideas for years, but uh, you know, th this this idea of of prevention is not just of primary disease, but also of of costly and difficult outcomes when people already have the disease. And so, you know, a pre predict and prevent approach, an investment, a strategic investment in the healthcare system to save those costs, costs in human life, costs in dollars, costs in healthcare resources, um, really is the way we have to adapt. And, and the related but slightly different uh, idea that I think for cancer we're going to see unfold is one where we will have the tools to approach different cancers in a way um, kind of like with COVID, not all infections are created equal. Not, and you know, if you take something like lung cancer, not all lung cancers or leukemias are created equal. And we're getting better tools to be able to identify who is it that needs more therapy. Um, some of those have technologic steps, things like sequencing of tumors, understanding the fingerprint of diseases, knowing where to deploy different tools, who's just fine with standard treatments or maybe even watch and wait approaches. Um, and, and then others are digital. Uh, again, I think uh, COVID has unearthed, or unearthed the power of using um, using some of our digital platforms to get more information, understand who patients are, uh, and look for patterns to identify uh, different approaches, not just find new new signatures. You know, the Project Optima of the IMI is, you know, looking in, in prostate and lung cancer in particular to try to identify, you know, uh, uh, you know, fingerprints within the healthcare system that might identify uh, poor risk patients. Uh, but but we, we also are seeing, uh, you know, again, there are chances to identify people who already have the disease and help get them the quality of care that we know there's evidence that supports that these things will be helpful. If you've had a heart attack, if you've had a, you know, a, a fracture, if you've had cancer already, you're more likely to get cancer again. And so we want to make sure that the proper maintenance of, of quality um, algorithms and, and value-based uh, approaches that Antonella brought up uh, are, are implemented moving forward. So a real opportunity here, I think, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, examples coming out of, uh, of COVID, uh, you know, the, the one on a highest level that I'm hoping we get to talk about, the European uh, you know, Beating Cancer Plan is really one that we're large supporters of. But this idea that, that you can bring these stakeholders together and, and ultimately help uh, guide the path of cancer care on a population level using technology um, is, is fantastic. And, and, you know, certainly there are projects, I mentioned the Project Optima on a, on a little bit smaller level again, but using um, artificial intelligence, using different, um, you know, adaptive approaches to try to get, get at the heart of these diseases will be helpful. And then on a, a micro level, focus products, projects, even with, uh, you know, Antonella talked about, um, you know, some of the, the looks at, well, what has COVID taught us about um, when patients lose the opportunity for certain evaluations or, or, or certain touch points of the healthcare system. And, you know, certainly the, the IS, um, uh, I, IASTL, the, the lung cancer organization here in Europe is doing some great work looking uh, at, you know, what does it mean when patients, uh, if there's lower diagnosis, how, what, what are the, the barriers that are leading to some of these problems, you know, increased weights for scans and so forth. So I, you know, again, I think there are great opportunities to work here, but the common theme is we need to embrace, embrace this opportunity, embrace some of the, the tools that have been brought up by my esteemed colleagues here, you know, telehealth, certainly, um, uh, you know, looking across uh, uh, ways that whether it's for routine care or clinical trial access that the, the healthcare system has been able to adapt. Um, but this, the you know, I, I, I think we will be living with some of these consequences of COVID for some time to come. And the, the, the time is now to try to, again, learn from what's uh, come during this uh, pandemic and be able able to uh, ultimately deliver back to patients higher value care, uh, a predict and prevent approach that hopefully saves resources and health care dollars, and ultimately helps patients live better and longer lives um, where they don't have to feel like cancer patients, but they can um, be people living their lives, uh, not identified by their disease, but instead, uh, ho hopefully um, living, living higher quality uh, and, 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 and longer lives. Okay, thanks for that, Greg. I felt like it was almost an inspirational talk there. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. And you did mention very importantly the European Beating Cancer Plan. I mean, this sort of frames our, our discussion today in a way. Um, I'd like to invite everyone who's participating uh, in this meeting to 
put your questions into the discussion area in the chat so that I can uh, feed them through to, to the audience. Um, but while we wait for, for questions from the participants, uh, maybe I could come back to you, Johan, with my first question. You mentioned a very important point that cancer nurses were recognized for their expertise in infection control and very often pulled off to COVID wards for this. But then on the other hand, you have this contrasting situation where the nurses had no, no power, no influence to say whether they could go or not, and not really part of that decision-making process. So in your or Eon's opinion, where is the best place that a nurse can be at the table? Is it at the European level? Is it in the hospital? Is it in a regional board? Where should nurses be to improve the quality of care? Thank you, Emma, for that question. And if you ask my opinion, then I would say in the different level levels, they should be represented from, for example, the hospital level, as national, as European level. They should be influenced and all to, uh, to share their expertise. And unfortunately, luckily, in my, my also in Belgium, I think it's in the same situation, like, like Tit said, like, in our country also, we, especially or in our hospital, we choose like cancer care as a priority in COVID-19. And we should remain the, 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 the forces and the healthcare workforce also in cancer care. And that is also something we need to think about if you're making strategic uh, decisions, how you move forward. And I think that's the importance. And that's also raised in the discussion is like, how to make it important and like to say this is an important issue we need to address and to put forces into it because even when you didn't extract uh, for example cancer nurses from the cancer care pathway to provide the best optimal outcome for your patients in treatment and diagnosis then also even in this COVID-19 we need also to put in for example new ways and to put also extra people and extra um, measures to do for example and that's also something that it raised is like protecting already protecting a high uh, risk population from COVID-19 so we need to be for example in place like for example screening before patients coming in the outpatient clinic so we uh, create a, a safe environment and this is also something we can do for example use technology in the future so that people at home putting some questionnaire that they highlight some symptoms that are happening that we can make a triage and also taking the opportunities what Craig says is taking sometimes the opportunity in a, even in a crisis it's like thinking how we can reinvent ourselves and provide the best optimal care so we maintain the good quality outcomes and choose to uh, yeah, to choose for cancer care in the future and put it on a high level place, but also involve all experts around the table on the different levels to make these decisions. Thank you. Yeah, I quite understand. Um, and to, to come back to your, uh, that the, your, the expression you use, the tale of impact uh, for COVID, and I think, you know, it was also touched on by everybody. This is we're not, we're not really at the tip of the iceberg, but we're certainly uh, very close to it. Um, what do you think the EU can do? What, is, what, do, what do we see in the European Beating Cancer Plan now? And if it isn't there, what does it need to include um, to make sure that the next, let's say, decade um, of cancer care is really as given as much political attention to as it is now, because there is a fear that post-pandemic, um, this enormous interest in health that we've seen across Europe will actually fade away as ministers and governments change their priorities, because maybe because they simply don't have the energy to keep focusing on, on health. So what can we do? What do we need to see at the European level um, to ensure that cancer patients have the best uh, care going forward? <clears throat> yes, that's uh, <clears throat> a very big challenge, I have to say. Uh, one of the things that I would stress is a particular strength of the uh, EBCP, as I usually <laughs> uh, refer to, uh, is, of course, the focus on uh, primary prevention and uh, especially lifestyle determinants. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is a strong focus on tobacco, on alcohol, uh, inappropriate uh, nutrition and physical activity. Of course, in that sense, 
we know, and we have said that this, of course, all of us so many times, we are addressing all chronic diseases, not only cancer. So this is a synergistic uh, contribution of the EBCP to other chronic diseases, which shouldn't be um, uh, overlooked. Of course, you have to say, uh, I, 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 I'm afraid that, you know, whenever you are faced with such a big crisis as now, for, the, for a foreseeable future, there will be an enhanced attention to communicable diseases, obviously. First of all, because there will be still COVID lingering around, around even once the majority of the population is somehow <clears throat> protected, there is hope for sure. Uh, and I don't think that that will uh, easily fade. Of course, this means not only the public's attention, but also the politician's attention. So irrespective of, of the EBCP, there will be a challenge nationally when they are making priorities to say, well, okay, cancer is a huge problem. We know that, we, we, we accept it, but we still need to be prepared for the, the following months or a couple of years to see how COVID unveils. Um, and the, um, the, the very important thing I would say is that the European Commission now is, for the first time in, in many years, has took a top-down approach somehow. I'm not trying to imply that the creation of the EBCP was not a top-down process. It was created bottom-up from a lot of consultational work and so on. But of course, it is a top-down document in the sense that it now um, puts deadlines to certain actions and flagships that, of course, uh, they have to be enacted by member states. Uh, because if you say coverage by uh, screening programs of 90% uh, of the three screening programs, who is going to pay for the screening programs? Not the European Commission, the, the member states are going to pay for, and they have to organize them. Uh, similarly, for other targets that are to be reached, this is a huge challenge nationally. And of course, they will. Uh, they will have a challenge uh, in competing interests. I can tell you that there are jealousies from other communities. Uh, cardiology was once perceived as, as the, the top uh, of all and having a lot of advantages. But now maybe they, <laughs> they feel that they are not in the first place anymore. There are also neurodegenerative diseases that were put forward. So heavily uh, because of the toll that uh, they had amongst the uh, patients uh, due to, to, to COVID. So I think that the best that the commission could do would be two things. Um, uh, do the, the best for smart investment of the money that will come from RRF, partly also for those countries that are struggling infrastructurally to now use the, the funding, even, even the loan part, the, the the part that has to be um, returned uh, because it's cheap given that the inflation is looming uh, so that they can invest into capacity that they are lacking. This is incredibly important. So I'm moving also now to the, the area of care, not only prevention, obviously. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, the pressure on member states in complying with some financial commitments will have to still remain a bit loosened because uh, the pressures in the past have pushed some member states and notably uh, the southern member states, especially Greece, partly Italy, Spain and Portugal, uh, to, um, uh, their healthcare system, systems are under a lot of strain. So this should not be repeated even if we get into some sort of a new crisis. So these are the roles for, for the European Commission for me, because the rest of the job of the implementation <clears throat> has to be done in member states. And in order to, to monitor that and to facilitate that, we have put forward already an initiative, and it's under consideration at the, with the European Commission, in order to, to set up a process that may be a project hopefully, that would monitor how the flagships and the commitments and the actions are actually enacted in member states. This would be a sort of an insurance also to see 
how protected we are against um, you know delays that can can be caused by COVID. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because it was one question that I. I, I've been having over time, who's monitoring the impact of the beta cancer plan and who is holding them accountable for, for all of those funds, the 4 million euros that has been, has been committed. So it's great to hear about that project. It, um, Antonella, moving uh, to you, I was really interested to see about the, the survey um, that you conducted with all of your patients and the key lessons uh, learned from that. How do you see that that has the potential to impact uh, the beating cancer plan and its implementation? Uh, well, we have um, uh, heard from uh, from Tit that uh, you know prevention is um, is key. Of course, uh, prevention is uh, the the best uh, and the, the the preliminary step to avoid uh, to to cure cancer or to reduce uh, the the cancer cases. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, you know we we spoke about uh, the multidisciplinary. Uh, teams, uh, care teams. And um, uh, one important uh, thing is that uh, comorbidities, uh, you know, cancer related complications and comorbidities uh, uh, are now addressed uh, in the cancer plan. And uh, uh, to us, uh, this is uh, very important. Uh, this is uh, important also. Um, Anyway, I cannot say to please, but at least to consider uh, other conditions. Uh, and uh, as uh, you know, with the, the aging population, uh, uh, cancer is normally associated at least to another uh, comorbidity. So th that is uh, uh, very important. And then uh, also uh, the early diagnosis is uh, is fundamental. And I would uh, I can also mention you know uh, uh, that is uh, for cancer what is uh, very relevant is uh, an early and accurate diagnosis. And uh, now we have uh, so many new um, uh, diagnostic tools, uh, including, you know, biomarker testing, uh, that's very important. So for us also personalized medicine is, uh, is essential. Uh, and so um, uh, we are uh, now establishing a task force uh, within the ECPC with, uh, with a number of, uh, um, uh, of other stakeholders uh, in order to make sure that uh, during the implementation of Europe's uh, beating cancer plan, the flagship on personalized medicine is really is implemented uh, uh, as uh, uh, as uh, most uh, appropriately, uh, and then also, uh, I mean, it has been mentioned by Tit already that it is important uh, to measure the outcomes of the implementation of the uh, Europe's uh, beating cancer plan, and we have also already started uh, working on uh, what we call a dashboard uh, together with uh, uh, FBI and the ECO. Uh, and we actually started on this dashboard uh, um, uh, as soon as uh, the Europe's uh, beating cancer plan was uh, conceived uh, already in 2019. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, the plan already includes uh, um, some sort of uh, uh, measurements on inequalities uh, as uh, the plan uh, is uh, looking uh, at uh, uh, the introduction of a uh, of the inequalities uh, registry but we want to go beyond that uh, and identify indicators for all the flagships and um, uh, and make sure that they are uh, uh, measured uh, because we do want to measure the the progress and the success of the plan mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, and Greg, um, so I, I have a trick, maybe a tricky question for you in terms. Those are the best. One of the one of the subjects that hasn't come up in this uh, discussion today um, has been well treatment delays because people not not going to hospitals, but also supply chain shortages and yep. Uh, yep. delays due to medicines. Um, do you, do you have any idea of how prevalent that is across Europe and what the key challenges have been? Yeah, I, I, I think that this actually has been raised um, and, and uh, Professor A uh, brought it up as well. Supply chain shortages um, for a variety of cancer care needs have been a challenge. When it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, um, 
the, there has also been, you know, challenges, particularly with regard to the fact that, you know, many of the small molecules and the chemistry involved with them, uh, this is sort of like building an air, airplane. There are many different distributors who are part of that complex uh, chain. And as it's been raised earlier, this is not always thought of, um, you know, by governments as a strategic capability. So there's been an outsourcing. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, I, I'm very fortunate that my organization seems to have um, uh, been able to uh, get through this and move forward appropriately. But th this idea of building resiliency and redundancy in the supply chain is just as important there as it is for the healthcare, uh, you know, delivery aspect. You, you know, the idea that there's surge capacity available, um, the idea that we need to again think of this as an investment for the long term, um, presuming that it will be there and deliver value. And you know, again, prevention isn't sexy, but offsetting cost losses. I mean, look at look at the incredible cost to society, uh, even outside the healthcare uh, sector uh, from from this, um, you know, pandemic that we're facing. Uh, I, I do believe, again, that that this building this resiliency into the system is going to remain important, whether we're talking about masks, whether we're talking again about uh, our, our nursing, uh, you know, workforce, or whether we're talking about uh, medications as well. Uh, the, the, the good news, you know, again, I'm, I'm not gonna not gonna get away with the with with being too, uh, um, you know, uh, too overcast here. The good news here is we've seen that um, the system can adapt. I think particularly with regard um, to the, uh, the 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 healthcare sector being able to produce vaccines at an unprecedented rate. Regulators, healthcare providers, um, uh, you know, working to adapt what used to be some of their processes a little bit more stringent um, or, or or slower and and just for the good of the world come together work in a multidisciplinary fashion and get whether it's the vaccines or the antiviral therapies or again the boots on the ground care delivery that needs to happen that adaptation is something that I hope we can hold on to and we can harness um, getting medicines to cancer patients faster we are seeing regulators um, you know again make that a priority but at the heart and I think Antonella brought this up we need to be evidence based we need to have the, the appropriate um, you know, value argument about drugs. And that's more than just, you know, cost. That's also about the outcome measures. And then make sure that the implementation that we're putting into, um, you know, into the, 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 the healthcare sector, that we're tracking what's going on and that you, we continue to have this, these iterations where we're trying to improve. It's a complex problem, but there are some successes I think that we can point to of recently. And, and certainly I, I do imagine that the supply chain question is gonna be one that we'll continue uh, to discuss, but look there, look exactly what could happen when resources were put into it in advance. Um, now the problem is getting shots into arms and, and that's probably for an entirely different uh, panel discussion, but, the, but uh, for many countries around the world, the shots are there and we continue to need to make that supply available more broadly uh, in Europe and beyond. Okay, thank you. Um, audience, I'm afraid I can't see you in this webinar setup, but uh, Danielle, do we have any questions from, from the participants? We don't at this stage yet, no, we don't have any questions at the moment. Okay. So if there are no more questions, then I would like to, we're a few minutes early, but thank you to all of our panelists today. It's been a really interesting discussion. Um, we will be following up with a, a short policy brief on this, which we will share with everybody once it's written. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day.